Our next topic of study is the period between the early Republic, which we just finished up, and the Civil War. And our first topic to discuss in that time period is Jacksonian democracy, or the Jacksonian period. A French author of a book called American Democracy, Alexi de Tocqueville, was very worried about the concept of tyranny of the majority for the United States. The definition of that means that a minority group falls under the control of a ruling majority. Now, minority group might make you think of like our modern use of that term meaning like racial minorities. It really refers to political minorities, people who are getting outvoted by others. The more a republic like the United States trended toward democracy, de Tocqueville was predicting the more opportunity there was going to be for a ruling majority to have tyrannical kind of control over the minority. A famous quote from Ben Franklin, Democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what to have for lunch. Liberty is a well-armed lamb contesting the vote. One benefit to this Jacksonian period in which you did indeed see a trend towards more democracy over traditional republicanism was that the penny press made newspapers extremely cheap for people to purchase and stay informed. And by the year 1840, more and more newspapers are sold in the United States than in all of Europe. All of Europe. And you also have increasing literacy rates at the same time. So not only are newspapers cheaper and being sold at larger numbers than in all of another continent on the other side of the world with a much larger population, but you also have more people that are able to read that information as well at the same time. Now, the era of good feelings we discussed was this period when James Monroe was president. Everybody's kind of on the same page. Well, in 1824, this comes to a sudden end. The first major issue that led to a downward trend in this era of good feelings was the Mur Missouri Compromise in 1820. And then, four years later, perceived political corruption in the election of 1824 and what comes to be referred to by Andrew Jackson and his supporters as the corrupt bargain. Much more to come on this. First, the Missouri Compromise. Missouri had reached the population requirements to become a state and applied for statehood as a slave state. However, this would throw off the balance of power in the Senate. There were an equal number of slave and free states at the time. To maintain the balance, Maine, which had previously been a part of Massachusetts, became a free state at the same time and maintained the balance of power. This further exposes this North versus South divide. We already talked about this in debates over things like Hamilton's financial plan, for example. And eventually this is going to lead to the Civil War. Part of the Missouri Compromise is the 3630 latitude line, which is the southern border of Missouri, being utilized to say anything south of this line is open to slavery, anything north of it is not. The problem is that only what is colored purple here in the Louisiana Territory was actually part of the United States at the time. And once the Mexican War is fought to uh, gain what comes to be known as the Mexican Cession, so a lot of this territory here, once that land is gained, it reignites the debate over slavery. But we will come back to that in later lessons. Then you have the election of 1824. By 1824, most of the landowning qualifications for voting had been revoked. 
with the only remaining barrier in most places being that of a taxpayer. You had to, in some way, shape, or form, be a taxpayer. And in time, even that would be gotten rid of. You just had to be an adult male citizen in order to vote. So in the presidential election, Andrew Jackson won the popular vote by more than 13 percentage points over the next highest candidate, which was John Quincy Adams. However, he did not get an electoral majority in the Electoral College. Failing to secure that electoral majority, the election was thrown into the House of Representatives. It's still that way today, as a matter of fact. If there was a tie or a lack of a majority, it would be decided by the House of Representatives. When third-party candidate Henry Clay threw his support behind John Quincy Adams, only later to be named Adams Secretary of State, Jackson and his followers declared a corrupt bargain had taken place. In this time period, the person who served as Secretary of State often went on to become the president. And so Henry Clay was viewed as having been bribed by the John Quincy Adams campaign to throw his support behind him rather than Jackson. And in 1828, Jackson's common man image carried him to a resounding victory over John Quincy Adams. And he just banged and banged on this message of a corrupt bargain, a corrupt bargain. You can see here what I was referring to about voting requirements. In 1800, many states had property qualifications. Some had taxpayer qualifications. And only the states of Vermont and Kentucky had adult male citizens having universal suffrage. Obviously, that it meant that most all eligible voters were white. Now, by 1830, many of those states that had once required property had dwindled down to only Tennessee and North Carolina. There were taxpayer qualifications in many of those formerly property qualification states. But more and more states, rather than only Vermont and Kentucky, you can see South Carolina has universal suffrage. Maryland, Missouri, New York, Maine. There are more and more states getting to universal white male suffrage. Adult male citizens, essentially. And you can see the very divided election of 1824 here. 1824, John Quincy Adams dominates the Northeast. Andrew Jackson dominates most of the South, along with some Midwestern states and agricultural states like Pennsylvania. And Henry Clay won some of the other Midwestern states. And there were some divided states as well, like you can see a little bit of division here in Illinois, as well as division here in New York at that time. But this is a very divided election that leads to a lack of an electoral majority and the House of Representatives actually chooses the less popular candidate. Well this leads to Andrew Jackson campaigning hard against this supposed corrupt bargain and in 1828 yes John Quincy Adams still dominates the Northeast but Andrew Jackson dominates everything else in his elected president easily. Now with these democratic changes, more and more people are eligible to vote. They're more interested in voting for what they view as the common man like Andrew Jackson. You have what comes to be known as stump speaking becoming the norm. People going out to speak to the public and they call it stump speaking because sometimes if it was in a rural area you would literally just jump up on top of just about anything including a stump to rise above the crowd so that you'd have an easier time projecting your voice and you can see this man here is campaigning to a crowd of people uh, there's a wide range of people here you have a very wealthy man looking on here well, you have some children here that have been brought with their parents you also have what appear to be some lower class citizens in the background so a wide range of people Another George Caleb Bingham painting 
swaying the commoner's vote through, here's his painting, county election, you can see alcohol being served up here to a man and so really just bribing people for their votes. You'd hold these parties to encourage people to vote for you. Once Andrew Jackson is President of the United States, he is thought of as abusing his power, and even more so as he thought of abusing his power historically, now that we have the benefit of hindsight. He's looked upon as a very overbearing president that abused his power. One of the main ways that Andrew Jackson was viewed as having abused his power, and you can see it depicted in this political cartoon to the right, titled King Andrew the First, the he is holding the veto. He he's viewed as abusing his veto power. He is also trampling all over the Constitution of the United States, and he used his veto power in particular to try to kill the National Bank that he viewed as a corrupt system. He also threatened the use of his veto power to do away with protective tariffs and demanded a lowering of them. There was a negotiated lowering of tariffs. We'll come back to these issues in more detail. And lastly, probably what he is most remembered for as such an awful person is his support of Indian removal. And again, we will come back to this in a lot more detail in future slides. Jackson is also very well known for what's referred to as the spoils system. Traditionally speaking, ever since George Washington, presidential cabinet members performed their job for the president based on their qualifications for the job that they were best suited to the job. And Jackson, however, would reward his political supporters and friends with those employment opportunities. And so he fires previous cabinet members, holds over no one, and replaces them all with loyal supporters and friends. And really everyone after Jackson has used the same philosophy of rewarding their supporters with these positions. So the issue of killing the National Bank with his veto power. He viewed the bank as corrupt. It's only for wealthy Easterners, Northerners, um, and it discriminated against Southern and Western farmers. He vetoed an act of Congress in 1832 that would have rechartered the bank, and he aggressively campaigned against Henry Clay, the Whig candidate, in the election of 1832, saying that it was his veto that was the right thing to do, not Clay's support of the National Bank. Clay said it had been a disastrous mistake to the finances of the nation to veto the bank. Jackson, of course, said, nope, it was the right thing to do. That was the main part of the campaign in 1832. Popular opinion was with Jackson because he won a huge majority for re-election in 1832. Also, the battle over tariffs, another beef between Jackson and people like Henry Clay. Tariffs had been gradually increased over the years to support U.S. industries against foreign competition. It would make American goods more attractive to the consumer than foreign goods. Now, Jackson's vice president, John C. Calhoun, spoke out against these tariffs, and, and Jackson didn't entirely disagree with Calhoun. He was much on Calhoun's side of this issue, but he said this was because they benefited Northeast manufacturers and harmed Southern and Western farmers. Sound familiar? A lot like the controversy over the bank. He referred to the Tariff Act of 1828, Calhoun that is, as the Tariff of Abominations and Congress repealed certain parts of the act, but Southerners are still angry. So what is needed is some compromise, um, because it could have led to a much worse situation had there not been compromise. South Carolina passes an ordinance of nullification and even threatens to secede from the Union over these tariffs. Now, to go over a couple of these vocabulary terms, to nullify just means to cancel out. So, a federal law would be canceled out by a state. 
and to secede is to pull a state out of the Federal Union of States. And so this first threat of secession is over the tariffs that Calhoun was so angry about. Now, Jackson, as much as he agreed with Calhoun, also did not want to see the Union disintegrate. So Jackson vows to put down any rebellion, and this, for the first time, lays down the threat of civil war. So while Jackson sympathized with Calhoun's arguments, he also did not want to see the Union disintegrate, and so threatened to put down any rebellions by force. Lower class Southerners were desperate for land and what they referred to as the West because it was their only opportunity to better themselves with more land. And Jackson wanted to encourage what he referred to as civilized Native Americans to simply assimilate into white society, but saw any Natives who sought autonomy and independence from the United States and the U.S. way of life as in the way of progress. So essentially, you're either going to assimilate and live life the way we want you to, or we are going to remove you. And so the Indian Removal Act of 1830 was signed to force Native Americans, primarily Cherokees and Creeks in the southeast, specifically Georgia, off of their lands. And you can see in this painting the depiction of forcible removal of Native Americans from their homes. The Supreme Court disagreed with Jackson and said that not only was the act of Congress, but his enforcement of it was unconstitutional. That Indian removal itself is unconstitutional, that the Cherokee people, and therefore other Native Americans, are entitled to their sovereignty, which is independence from any U.S. jurisdiction on their land. Now, very famous quote from Andrew Jackson, very much alike thumbing his nose at the court. John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. Jackson essentially pointing out, and if you remember, in the three branches of government, Congress makes laws. The court interprets them, but it is the president's job to enforce. And so Jackson essentially said, I'm going to ignore this decision of the court in Worcester v. Georgia, and I'm going to continue to enforce what they declared unconstitutional. So he is literally thumbing his nose, not only at the courts, but at the Constitution itself, because the courts said this is unconstitutional. And what does it result in? One of the most tragic events in all of American history, and that is the Trail of Tears, in which Cherokees in particular were forced from their land and marched west to make room for more plantations in the state of Georgia. In this painting, you can obviously see tears, but probably most tragically of all, you see people who have stepped off the trail to aid someone who is quite literally dying on the side of the trail from this forced march to the West. Probably one of the single greatest stains on American history. That's the end of the Jacksonian period presentation. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out or ask. Otherwise, I'll see you in class.